his lecture today is uh, accounting for spatial variability in nonlinear dynamic analysis of ground deformations at Wayne Avenue in the Northridge earthquake. Please welcome Ross. Thank you, Koji. Uh, really do wish we were in person together. It would be great to see you again. Um, <laughs> it brings back good memories, all the different events we've had. And Dharma and I were co-hosts for PBD3. And so I really uh, can appreciate all the work that Len Min Wang and others have put in. So with, with that, thank you for the introduction. And um, you've already heard my title. Uh, the paper uh, describes us is written by uh, doctoral student Patrick Vassal, working with myself. Uh, Patrick is just about to file his thesis and will be an assistant professor at the Ohio State University coming uh, January of the upcoming year. And so uh, this particular uh, story that I'm going to tell is part of an overall objective at integrating nonlinear dynamic analyses, which we'll call NDA um, procedures, with stochastic models of the subsurface variability for problems that involve liquefaction and cyclic softening. So that's kind of our overall focus. And we're trying to add the lessons from a number of prior studies, including some of those illustrated in the graphics below here, we're trying to build up some experience with these tools. Now, the specific objectives for the Wynn Avenue case study that we'll look at are to evaluate these procedures for a site where we have moderate deformations, and then also evaluate the effects of alternative subsurface modeling approaches and see how sensitive results are to these details. So the presentation, it will start with some background on Wynn Avenue in the 94 Northridge earthquake. Then we'll look at the subsurface modeling. Then we'll go to the nonlinear dynamic analyses, and then we'll have some concluding remarks. So first, a little background on Wynn Avenue. Wynn Avenue is located in the San Fernando Valley, which is north of Los Angeles in California. It's very close to the epicenter of the magnitude 6.7 Northridge earthquake. And we have a nearby recording station. The USC-3 station is about 1.7 kilometers away, similar uh, location relative to the fault surface, where a peak ground acceleration of about 0.45 G was recorded. Now, this site was investigated uh, extensively by the US Geological Survey uh, and documented in papers and reports by Tom Holzer and Bennett and colleagues. And this photograph here shows the site uh, a year after the earthquake. And you see the uh, two people are standing between cracks in the pavement with a, a grub in between them. Now, I'll hide that, highlight that with that red dashed line. And basically, that is a 12 meter wide graben with about a 10 to 20 centimeter down drop. And the question was, well, you know, what subsurface details led to this specific feature at this location? And could we understand that? Uh, we also know that the general area is moving around. Uh, for example, from Department of Water and Power records, show that within about a 300 meter range of this map ground deformation, there are eight breaks to cast iron water distribution mains and one break to a large diameter trunk line. And these just illustrate that sometimes the ground deformations are subtle enough, they don't manifest clearly at the surface, but they're damaging to buried utilities. So we wanna have a look at this more moderate case of ground movements. The USGS did a number of explorations uh, over a 500 meter array along Wynn Avenue. Uh, right in the middle there are some uh, purple lines. These purple lines are the, the um, outline of the Graben extent, which kind of goes oblique to the roadway there. You see the CPTs were clustered close together near the Graben to pick up some of the details and then spaced out more broadly as you move further away. This is a cross section illustrating the subsurface conditions at the site. The observed Graben is marked here in the middle. The upper unit A is essentially road base and fill materials. Unit B is soft to firm clays over bank clay deposits. Then unit C is a stiffer clay over bank clay deposit 
which has interbedded sand units, this one labeled C1 and this one below it C2. Now I'm going to zoom in a little bit closer to illustrate that in the area of the Graben, there are many more CPTs located to kind of pick up the details. And if we zoom in right about the edge of the Graben, you see a change in the characteristics of the CPT signatures. On the downhill side, the CPTs have lower tip resistances and boring show that you have about 45% fines or greater. They're sandy silts mostly. On the uphill side, you get more cleaner silty sands, less than 30% fines and much higher penetration resistances. So there is some contact right in about that area. And that's interpreted as being a discontinuous contact between two different types of channel sand deposits. And I'll relate that back to the depositional environment in the valley. So the upper photo is showing Wynn Avenue is located within the San Fernando Valley. And the valley has filled with alluvial fan deposits that come off the surrounding hills. You get streams coming off the hill that are ephemeral and when you get high flows, you get sheet flood deposits that come down over the fans, as well as the channels over top, and then the rivers uh, evolve or change location. And that evulsion leads to this interbedding of laterally discontinuous channel sands within what are predominantly clay overbank deposits. And in addition, about the upper eight to 12 meters is uh, Holocene in age which includes those channel sands and the soft overlying um, clays, unit B that I showed you just a second ago. We'll come back to that in a bit more. Okay, so now the subsurface modeling. Now in general, when we're looking at different environments, we can think of uh, the general approach. We might look at heterogeneity in three different scales. The first would be stratigraphic heterogeneity. And these are the larger scale differences due to formational processes. The second would be lithological heterogeneity, where we're looking at persistence of distinct interlayers within some uh, strata. And the third would be the inherent soil variability, the more small scale variations within a distinct lithological mass. Stratigraphic heterogeneity, that large scale uh, uh, formational process driven heterogeneity is generally deterministically inferred from our in situ and geologic data. But when we go to lithological heterogeneity, there are a number of ways to model the uncertainty in defining those smaller scale uh, variations. And they sequential indicator, transition probability, et cetera. Now we've used transition probability in a lot of our work, but we're not gonna need to use it today. When we're looking at inherent variability, again, there's a number of different approaches. Um, they're listed here. Today, we're going to use sequential Gaussian simulations for looking at inherent soil variability. So with that, we can jump back to Wynn Avenue. And this is the stratigraphy as defined deterministically. And the units on here that are going to be important to us in terms of ground deformations are going to be the softer portions of unit B and the saturated portions. So this B sat unit is going to be important. And then the interbedded sand unit C, C1, broken into the C1A and C1B components, those are where the ground deformations are going to be rooted. So it's in those two units that we will put in inherent variability. And again, zooming in at the middle part of, of this profile, I'll point out the numerical model does the whole 500 meters, but keep showing results kind of for a central portion. And so we're going to put in inherent variability in C1A, C1B, and the saturated overbank clay deposits. And the mesh here is on the order of about a quarter meter uh, in vertical dimension in, in the critical units. And they get about as meter thick when you get down into the dense Pleistocene sands that underlie it. So now with that, we're going to do three different subsurface models. The first subsurface model is going to be a uniform analysis model, just like we would do in practice. We'll define the stratigraphy deterministically, just as shown in the previous slide. And this time, we will have no inherent soil vari variability. We are going to assign each of those strata a uniform representative property. The baseline uniform analysis model will use the 50th percentile properties 
spatially declustered for the for the, the the array of investigations, and then we look at other percentiles and sensitivity studies. The second set of analysis models are stochastic models where we include variability within BSAT and the C1 zoned. Now, by C1 zoned, I mean that we're going to include that distinct break between the C1A kind of sandy silts, the weaker materials downhill, and, and then the, the little denser, cleaner uh, sandy silts or silty sands, C1B on the uphill side of where that graben was observed. And we're going to use sequential Gaussian simulation to, to generate the realizations. Okay, now the third one is going to be a stochastic model for BSAT and C1 group. In this one, what we're going to do is just lump all the properties and data for C1A and C1B together into C1 as a grouped layer and see if these conditional realizations can still generate um, reasonable results without that stratigraphic break. Now, to get to those uh, stochastic realizations, we need some property distributions. And so this first figure is showing a cumulative distribution of the peak undrained shear strength ratio, SU over sigma VC prime, for the overbank um, soft to firm lean clays in unit B. And so what we have here is each of these gray lines is an individual CPT uh, used to infirm undrained strengths. If you group the data and weight it, you get the solid dark line, and it tells you you get about a median SU ratio of about, say, 0.35. And then you also have the distribution. We do the same thing for the uh, interbedded uh, channel sand unit C1, and we break it into the C1A soils on the downslope side and the C1B on the upslope. C1A has more than 45% fines and, and maybe a median QC1N clean sand of about 90. The uh, cleaner sands on the uphill side, C1B, have a median QC1N maybe of about 130. And then if you lump them together, you're going to get the black line, which is something in the middle. And then here I would just point out that these QC1N clean sand values are based on the triggering correlation by myself and Ed Idris. Uh, the data are inverse filtered for thin layer and transition effects, and they use a site-specific fines content correlation. We also need the variograms. And so this figure is showing normalized variograms. The three figures on the left are for the vertical direction. The three on the right are for the horizontal direction. The top are for the overbank clays B. Then C1A in the middle and C1B in the bottom. And these are normalized, but what you get is vertical ranges of about 1.2 meters to say a, a half a meter. And that makes sense when you look at the CPT soundings. The horizontal ranges are, are, are not as well defined, even with the amount of data we have. Uh, they were assigned ranges of 30 to 80 meters. So you get some continuity laterally um, along the channels. Now, you take that information and you then use sequential Gaussian simulation to generate realizations. And so this, uh, figure here in the top is showing contours of undrained strength ratio in the overlying overbank clays, and then QC1N clean sand within the channel sands. This top figure here is the undrained strength ratio versus position along the uh, wind avenue. The red zone is where the graben has been observed. And then what you have here is, is right where that graben is observed, just downslope of it, that unit B, those clays are slightly softer and we get undrained strength ratios that are on the order of say 0.25 to 0.35. And when we include that, you'll see this shows up in strain patterns. If we then go down and look at the QC1N clean sand values in those channel sand uh, deposits, then the C1A has tip resistances that are about 90. The C1B has tip resistances that go from say, well, as high as 200 down to 100, more like 120 to 160 mostly. And then upslope, we don't have enough detail upslope, but you step back based on the last CPT back into a sandy silt. And so we consider that a, a comparable layer back to C1A. All the gray lines are 20 different realizations. The black line is from the single re realization R1 that we will look at uh, for dynamic 
uh, results is illustrative. And then the purple dots are data that uh, show that these are conditional realizations. So the realizations go through the data. Okay, that was the one sequential Gaussian simulation. This is the second one. And this time C1 is grouped. The properties for the overbank clay are the same as the other case. We don't change that. So what changes is that in the channel sense, the QC1CS is determined with all the data into the same simulations. Now, what I'll point out is right around the Graben, we have a lot of CPTs closely spaced. And so the data will go through, the realizations go through the data, and we still predict, therefore, that sharp change in penetration resistances. There's two, two other details. So one is that because the data are grouped, if you look at the, the heat map up top here, the contours, you can see it will produce continuity in lenses across that zone. And the second is on the uphill side where we don't really have data, it produces a almost an interpolation between the weaker materials far upslope, the stronger materials near the Graben, and, and this has an effect on what happens in the upslope direction. Okay, those are three models. Now we can look at some results. So the nonlinear dynamic analyses that we're gonna do are using uh, FLAC uh, with the user-defined constitutive models, PM4 sand and, and PM4 silt. And uh, these are two-dimensional analyses. They're coupled with pore pressure diffusion and large deformations. We have a compliant base where we input both the horizontal and vertical components at the same time. And I already described the, the mesh elements uh, previously. A couple of things on the constitutive models uh, for the sand units, we're using PM4 sand. This is a critical state stress ratio based bounding surface plasticity model put together by myself and Katarina Ziotopoulou. Uh, the manual, the dynam dynamic link library and calibration files are available at our website. This model has three primary input parameters a relative density that you estimate from your in-situ test data, a shear modulus coefficient that you can use to calibrate to in-situ shear wave velocities, and then a contraction rate parameter that you use to calibrate the model to give you the target cyclic resistance ratio for the magnitude seven and a half and one atmosphere overburn stress using whatever triggering correlation you prefer to use. And then the bottom figure is just an illustrative uh, response of the model to show it generates that cyclic mobility and accumulation strains uh, after triggering liquefaction. Now the overbank clay deposits are gonna be modeled using uh, PM4 silt. Uh, this model is, is similar to PM4 sand. It has some variations and changes from it. Again, by myself and uh, Katarina Ziotopoulou. Three primary inputs, you put the undrained shear strength, for critical state conditions. You put in the shear modulus coefficient to get the shear wave velocity you want. And then you have a contraction rate parameter to control how the cyclic strength varies as a, as a ratio of the undrained monotonic strength. And an illustrative response is shown below, showing you can simulate the behavior we often observe where pore pressure ratios don't quite get to 100%, but you do lose effective stress. You generate and accumulate shear strains, albeit sometimes with slightly wider hysteresis loops. Okay, so a couple more details. Um, the PM4 sand uh, input parameters are calibrated to the triggering correlation by myself and Ed Idris. For the analyses, the baseline analyses I'm gonna show you, we're using the expected cyclic strength and then we do parametric variations on uh, more design values and other percentiles. Uh, there are a number of other parameters for the uh, constitutive model, and those unlisted secondary parameters retain the default values that are per the manual uh, that we provide for the, the model. And then what I'm showing you here is, is a table for the baseline uniform um, soil uh, units. So this, in this case, this is just summarizing the units to get PM4 sand. You solve for the, the properties given your representative QC1N clean sand values, and that works for the uniform model. When you do stochastic models, you have to account for a full range of penetration resistances. So in that case, we have the calibration performed for a range of penetration resistances, and then use lookup tables to get those. And the paper, uh, which um, 
I should apologize. I did not get it in time for the proceedings, but that was my fault. But we did get it in for the, uh, the special issue that will come afterwards. And the paper includes uh, the lookup tables as a supplement. So you can see how we do that. PM4 silt, it's basically the same story. I'm just telling you, we calibrate to the undrained strengths that come from the in situ test data. And, and then we give you the table for the baseline uniform properties and lookup tables for the stochastic models. So you can recreate any of these results if you're interested. We then need the input motions. And, and as I mentioned, we're going to use the USC3 station, which was 1.7 kilometers away. Uh, we take these uh, motions and they're shown here on the left as time histories and on the right is acceleration response spectra. Um, the <coughs> north -south, oh, north-south component is uh, shown in green here and that's aligned with the direction of Wynn Avenue. And this motion was deconvolved down to depth and then propagated back up to an outcrop for the underlying Pleistocene dense sands. That deconvolution didn't change the much record much. So if you dash line here is the original recording, the green line is what we have as an outcrop for the Pleistocene sands. And so there's some modest differences. Sensitivity results show you get essentially the same response with either motion. Okay, so now we can get to some analysis results. I'm doing okay for time. So baseline uniform model first. So the simplest one. And I'm gonna show this time history showing the generation of strain in the different units. So let's get this thing started. Hopefully I can get it to go. There we go. And if you watch C1A, this is the loosest sand on the downslope side, you see the strain start to accumulate throughout the, the looser C1A sands. And then as things are deforming, you generate a, a, a shear band that propagates to the ground surface, and then eventually a complementary one, and the block in between them drops down a certain amount. So we look at contours at the end of shaking. These are the excess pore pressure ratios on the bottom. And you can see we've liquefied most of C1A, the looser sand, and then very little and, or lower pore pressures within the denser C1B. You do look up top for strains. You see most of the strains are now concentrated in the liquefied C1A layer. And then you see the mechanism that forms at the surface. And this is the part that's gonna drop down. These are horizontal displacements. They show that the soil overlying C1A is largely moved as a block downslope with movements of up to 36 centimeters. And these are vertical settlements that show you that right where you have that robin form, you get about a 10 to 15 meter wide robin and about 14 centimeters of downdrop. And that is pretty close to the field observation of a 12 meter wide robin and 10 to 20 centimeters of downdrop. So this model, by getting the stratigraphy, the stratigraphic detail, the larger scale stratigraphic details right, but just using uniform properties within individual strata, did a pretty good job of reflecting the field observations. So now we're gonna add some stochastic variability. Now, here I'm showing the case for C1 zone. And C1 zoned is where we still have the C1A and the C1B separately uh, generating realizations for those units. So we'll start this thing up here. There's the time history. Now, if you watch, you're going to see some strains develop in the overbank clays. You get strains in the overbank clays. You get a lot of strain in the C1A sand again. And then you get the mechanism forming up towards the ground surface right near the contact between that C1A and C1B. So we still get that, that, that uh, mechanism hitting the surface. It's not as distinct as before. Now I want to point out we get strains in the overbank clays because remember I showed you when you do the stochastic, uh, when we looked at the data, that unit was softer just down slope of where the grubbin was observed. And those undrained strength ratios of about 0.25 shaken with 0.45 Gs are enough to get some yielding and deformation in there. So now we see pore pressures again, mostly in C1A liquefying, pockets of C1B liquefying. We see strains throughout C1A, that looser sand, and you start to see strains being significant in the overbank clays, and they extend upslope of that contact between C1A and B. Horizontal displacements, kind of more or less the same pattern, 
You get about 38 centimeters for this one case down slope. Uh, all the different realizations, you get about 35 to 45, so not a big range. Vertical drops, the Graben drops about nine centimeters in this case, and we get eight to 12 for the different realizations. And so what this shows is adding the spatial variability, we still get pretty reasonable results, albeit we get slightly less uh, sharp variations in the horizontal displacements. Uh, that results in a slightly smaller amount of downdraft. If I look at what that means in terms of horizontal displacements versus position along Wynn Avenue, then the middle one will be vertical uh, movements at the ground surface. And the bottom one will be horizontal strains at the ground surface. And what we see for horizontal displacements is upslope of the Graben. We're computing you know, things like five to 10 centimeters. Uh, I want to point out the blue line is the baseline uniform analysis model. The uh, gray lines are all the 20 realizations with stochastic C1 zone. And you see that they're pretty comparable. Uh, you get a little more displacement with the stochastic models and a little smoother variation in horizontal displacements, but about similar magnitudes of, of peak displacement. Because you have a smoother variation in horizontal displacement, the strains, extensional strains are actually smaller in the stochastic models than in the uniform model. And that means you get a slightly smaller down drop than you do with the uniform model. But in general, they're still pretty consistent. So now I'm going to do the third model. This is the stochastic model where we're going to just say, what if we just thought that everything in layer C1 was about the same and we modeled it all together? So the C1 group case. Now this is realization one. Now what you're going to see is you're going to see strains still in the overbank. You see strains in C1A, but now you see those strains propagating up into C1B because we have some continuity of loose layers across them because they're generated as being part of the same strata. And then we see some liquefaction further upslope in, in unit B in part because it's it's uh, um, interpolating out to that weaker CPT upslope. Pore pressures, they're just showing you the same thing. Now we're getting liquefaction out in C1B. You see we're getting strains out here in C1B. We're getting strains across that interface. Horizontal displacements are quite different. Right about where the Graben was observed, we're computing maybe 15, 20 centimeters of horizontal displacement. But we're getting uh, 30, 40, 50 centimeters further upslope. And then we're getting similar numbers downslope. And what that means is with very similar displacements, we get almost no down drop. And now our down drop is only about five centimeters or about three to eight over the 20 different realizations. So this result is more conservative in the view that it predicts larger displacements propagating further up the roadway, up the avenue, but it doesn't get the, the feature, the detail of the local variation. It's just, I think, adds to the kind of humility that the patterns of deformation can be very sensitive to how you represent subsurface variability. And that's shown in this figure, same kind of figure you've seen before, horizontal displacement. There's the baseline model. If we gr grouped everything in C1 as one stochastic layer, you see this where we're predicting these larger displacements very small gradients of horizontal displacement, very small down drops, and much smaller extensional strains. So conservative in predicting bigger displacements, but not picking up the detail of that Graben feature. So I have some uh, concluding remarks. Yeah, and I'm doing okay for time. So first, first one, the Wynn Avenue site was chosen in part to give us a test of these nonlinear dynamic analysis procedures when we're looking at moderate displacements, and we wanted to see if we could pick up the spatial distribution of these liquefaction-induced ground deformations. And, and the performance of the site, as kind of explained by Holzer, and, and we're just amplifying on this, is that the observed Graben coincides with the abrupt contact between the C1A and C1B channel sands. And the weaker C1A unit is, is sandy uh, silts and silty sands. That 
appears to have liquefied extensively, and that gives us lateral spreading down uh, displacements downslope of this C1AB contact. So this is moving downslope. The stronger C1B unit, lower fines contents, higher tip resistance, appears to have liquefied less extensively and or developed smaller lateral displacements upslope of that contact, and the difference in movements is why you get this local feature of a grout. When we look at what the nonlinear dynamic analyses did, they were in pretty good agreement with the field observations for the subsurface models that included that stratigraphic distinction between the C1A and the C1B. We put in that distinct break, was very important. Now I point out we get similar results with the baseline uniform analysis model as with the stochastic C1 zone model. And that suggests that modeling that inherent variability within those units was less important than getting the stratigraphic details, the larger scale distinction between C1A and C1B correct. We got the poorest agreement when we did the stochastic models with C1 grouped. And that's because when you omit the distinct contact between C1A and C1B, we get some continuous lenses, we get some gradual transitions, we produce the ability for mechanisms to form across both units, and then we get larger movements upslope. And, and the overall intent of this case study was just keep contributing to our body of validation experiences where we're using NDA models and subsurface modeling techniques to see if we can do large to small deformations and with different patterns and details. Uh, I'm gonna close by, I got, all thanks goes to the US Geological Survey. They provided all the site exploration data, uh, which was very generously shared. And the time and discussions and comments from uh, Tom Holzer were extremely valuable. And portions of this work were funded by our California Department of Water Resources. And uh, with that, I think I've successfully left you with barely time for any questions, Dharma. Thank you very much, Ross. Uh, but I would like to invite, uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah, okay. Uh, I would like to invite uh, questions from the audience, if you have any. Uh, please speak up because I may not be able to see all your hands up signals. Uh, looks like there aren't any, but uh, uh, I have a question for you, uh, Ross. Uh, if I if I think about this as a uh, practicing engineer, uh, at the current state. Uh, if I were to go and characterize a, a site to capture the local variability and use your software, are we looking at a fair bit of increased geotechnical investigation effort? Yeah, um, so there's there is two parts to that. Um, I would say the, the most important thing, uh, given the time, Dharma, I think the, the most important thing is sufficient explorations to make sure you do not miss a geologic detail. So you, you need to get the stratigraphic details right. That's like first order. And so missing a channel or missing a detail is, is your biggest problem. After you, you're comfortable with that, th then it does take denser CPT spacings, uh, spacings to define um, your variograms and other things you need to do. But if you don't do that, you can still generate pretty reasonable results with using typical values and then doing parametric results and, and then getting a sense of the variability that comes from it. So that hasn't been too bad. Um, I would just add that the last point is that I think one of the things I've learned from these different analyses is uh, maybe more humility. Could be I'm getting older too, but more humility in that these analyses often give us pretty good results in, in terms of the overall magnitude and, and the major features, but some of the subtle patterns are driven by local scale details that you know, you, we just don't have characterized. So I think you have to allow for sharper patterns and variations in, in local scales. Thank you very much. And thanks a lot for this uh, very interesting and informative presentation on this uh, very important topic for us uh, as uh, geotechnical engineers. Thank, oh, thank you. you.